the Popcorn Digest with Gareth and Andy. Popcorn Digest. Hello, I'm Gareth. And I'm Andy. And welcome to the Popcorn Digest, a podcast series in which we digest the best and worst popcorn movies Hollywood has to offer. Today we're preparing our captain's log for Justin Lin's Star Trek Beyond. But does this ship soar, or is this just a trek too far for this rebooted crew? Listen on to find out. My dad joined Starfleet because he believed in it. I joined on a dare. You joined to see if you could live up to him. You spent all this time trying to be your father. Now you're wondering just what it means to be you. It isn't uncommon, you know. It's easy to get lost in the vastness of space. There's only yourself, your ship, your crew. In the third year of their five-year mission to explore deep space, Kirk and his crew find themselves stranded on a remote alien planet after the USS Enterprise is once more destroyed, posing the question, is it really worth rebuilding this starship, or should Starfleet skip the middleman and blow it up in its dock? With the aid of a planet native, the remaining crew must work with the elements to reunite and find a way back home. So Andy, did Star Trek Beyond set your phases to fun? Or was this a trek beyond saving? A line that I nicked <laughs> from, from <me>. you <laughs> from our other podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely set my phases to extreme fun, thankfully. Yeah. Because with this film, and I think it kind of works the more time you do it, actually, because I think in this world where things are spoilt to the hilt and trailers are just absolutely shocking in how much things they spoil, I've got to the point now where I don't watch any trailers for any films. So my expectations for this film were pretty much non-existent other than the fact that it had a cool poster and i was one of these people that was very much let down by star trek into darkness i uh, i found it very derivative and i didn't feel any to go in that direction i felt yeah. it was a massive step back from the first star trek reboot so thankfully i'm happy to say for me at least this is hands down the best of the revival so far no i absolutely agree with you i do think it's the best one and all of the elements in this film really work well yeah which is the first time for this rebooted crew that it does work that way it does feel like a star trek film now as well even though it's still just as fun just as popcorny just as actiony yeah. as the previous ones it's got a few more nods to the original series in ways that jj abrams i think was scared of in the way in which i would say that the set designs in jj abrams films i think he described them as apple shops in space that's the yeah, what they was yeah. going for whereas this one really tries to take us back to those 60s sets with primary colors and the, the frame's not as cluttered with light anymore i feel they're actually more organic nods than the ones they've put in the past obviously the last film had extreme jerky clumsy nods yeah where they basically ripped off the plot of an earlier film <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> just flipped the story somewhat to much lesser degree and the thing is when you do that and that's the thing that really annoyed me about into darkness it's only ever going to come across a second best because they yeah. hadn't laid the groundwork at that point yeah that film was just a complete step backwards in that this is a big step forward because the thing that makes this a much better film is that it's a nice standalone adventure. It doesn't have to tap into anything that's gone in the past. But this is basically the film that Into Darkness should have been. Yeah, this is essentially the sequel that wasn't. Yeah. And I would also say that this film does something right that those previous films don't which is it gives the entire crew of the Enterprise something to do. In that way, it does feel like a Star Trek film because the previous films, even though I do like the Star Trek reboot, I'm not too keen on Into Darkness for various reasons. I'm sure we'll get into at some point in the future. But they felt very much like the Kirk and Spock show yeah. with a little Uhura, I guess, and maybe Bones here and there. But they've mm. never really utilized the crew as well as one should really with that kind of yeah. wealth of character to mine. And this is the one that really gives all of these characters, all of these iconic characters, something to do. And you really feel like they've earned their names now. 
because that cast is solid. J.J. Abrams cast Star Trek wonderfully. But yeah. the thing that I don't think he ever got around to doing was using that cast to their full potential. Yeah. And this yeah. is a film that finally uses that cast to its full potential. And in that way, I think it does feel like the original series. Yeah, because I feel that this is a film that is very much focused and is about its crew yeah. rather than anything else. I mean, I felt like having the whole Khan thing in the last one really overshadowed everything. For no good reason, because they didn't need to do it in the first place, because I yeah. think it kind of didn't trust the fact that it could ride on its crew. Yeah. Whereas this wholeheartedly embraces that. And in fact, a lot of the other elements are kind of, they're more window dressing really to what the crew could achieve, yeah. which when you look at some of the, the Star Trek movies of old, that's what they did. Mm-hmm. The the story elements were kind of more peripheral to what the relationships of those characters were. Yeah. I feel that's what Star Trek has always ridden on especially mm-hmm. the original series where even when the budget ran out and things looked very very shaky it was the cast that got it through at the end of the day and i think that's sometimes something that some star trek fans can lose sight of sometimes where it, it this is a, a franchise yes it talks about big ideas and everything but it's a franchise that's always worked because of its characters more so than anything else and i think it's because of that i've always given the first star trek reboot a pass because it had to get all those characters in the right place, and that was essentially what the film was about. Mm. So on a story yeah. level, I've always given it a pass for the elements that don't work, which largely regard Eric Banner's character Nero. Yeah. And I think another thing as well that many Star Trek fans who I've at least spoke to have thought in regards to J.J. Abrams' new rebooted... I, I think they refer to this universe as the Kelvin timeline. Right. Okay, so yeah. I think from now on, I'm going to refer to it as the Kelvin timeline rather than J.J. Abrams universe because it's not quite, I don't think. But um, one thing they've always said in regards to it is that it's too fun to be Star Trek. It's too flashy. It's got too much action in it. But actually, I think Star Trek has, at least the original series, has always been about fun. Recently, I've revisited The Next Generation and I watched The Next Generation films recently. I think that's where the opinion yes, of them definitely. being a little bit more stuffy has the, come from. I always felt that the 80s, 90s Star Trek series were a little bit more sedate to compare to the original series. The original series was always uh, much goofier than the more modern Star Trek series. And I think that ultimately contributed to the series winding down in the early 2000s and why they had to reboot it. Because I feel, yeah, it was getting really stuffy and very... It became too much of a niche thing, I think. Uh, yeah. It became less and less popularist. And more and more bland as well, because I, I remember when Enterprise came out. I mean, it, it does have its fans, and I think they did manage to turn it around by the end. But I feel I think the first season of Enterprise was incredibly bland yeah. like in its characterization. And I, I, I'm always a thought that there's always a running joke about Star Trek Voyager, <laughs> about <laughs> certain characters just being there. Yeah. So towards the end of that chapter in Star Trek history... I felt that, yeah, it was getting a bit stuffy and and I think that's where all this feeling comes from. And yeah, I do understand that this new series has become a lot more action orientated, but I do feel that the one thing they definitely have done is brought back the characters and brought back the fun yeah. element. And in this film, I feel they bring back that 60s vibe more. Yeah. Yeah, this just feels more like Star Trek. Like, they still have all those action elements, but they're handled more tastefully. Yeah. And also, uh, even from the first five minutes, it just felt more like Star Trek. The thing is, I can imagine this story, when you strip it back of all its action, having a place in the original series. Mm. I can still see it being made in that very retro way. So I think even at its core, it still is a very Star Trekky story. And it still has very Trek things to say. It's, it's still got themes. I like that they even touch upon the feeling of growing old and death, yeah. which is referenced in The Wrath of Khan. But the film doesn't get bogged down in that. No. It kind of lifts it somewhere else. Yeah, th- this is definitely something that if you stripped it of all its sort of blockbuster elements, it would still make a really good Star Trek episode. Yeah. The great thing about this film is that, yes, it is a revenge story, but it's not one of those films that everybody seems to be doing at the moment where it's personal yeah this is a revenge story but it's much more general yeah it's it's, it's more about someone being angry at an entity that doesn't really exist in its current form anymore yeah. it's somebody who's just trying to channel their anger into something and that happens to be some unfocused revenge plot yeah and that comes across very well with that character 
I would say that one thing that I have seen raised as an issue, and I haven't really read any reviews, but from a couple of the tweets that I've read just before we started recording, is that this is a film that doesn't really bring anything new to Star Trek. I think Sight and Sound actually mentioned that. And, and I would agree with that. It doesn't bring anything new to Star Trek in particular. It doesn't do anything differently. But I think this was a film that was very much needed at this time. It was a film that took a Star Trek story and just told it very, very well. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we needed. It was almost like in reference to Star Wars The Force Awakens. That took a very familiar Star Wars story after the prequels. Decades of shit. Exactly. <laughs> and and course corrected in a massive way. Yeah, just to, yeah. It's almost like it's the gateway to a new place by starting on a familiar point. Yeah, I'm always in disbelief at people who say, oh, the Star Wars prequels are better than Force Awakens. Yeah. Just because. Uh, they need to get their fucking heads checked. I, th- <laughs> I think the point that's always brought about is that, oh, well, at least George Lucas was trying to do something different with those films. And he brought... He wasn't trying to do anything. He brought different <laughs> he um, imagery with He got lost in him. his own story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do think George Lucas tried to do something different. He just wasn't the person to do anything. I do. Well, he just wasn't equipped. No. Do that. But moving back to Star Trek, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Star Wars and Star Trek are always closely tied together. Yeah, well, they both begin with Star. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I actually thought about this film long ago when it first went into production was that I was really worried that if they continued this path of trying to make it more Star Warsy, which J.J. Abrams had said from the beginning that because he wasn't a Star Trek fan, what he was trying to do was make a Star Wars film in the Star Trek universe. Yeah. And yeah. he largely succeeded in that for one solid film. Mm. And I was worried that in a world where Star Wars now has a place, The Force Awakens has proven that it still has a place amongst audiences. Will Star Trek continue Mm. to have a place? Will it continue to have an identity? And I'm really glad that they've almost had the foresight to know with Star Wars coming back, they needed to do something that would still give Star Trek its identity. And I'm glad they have gone along that way. Because this is the film that helps to reaffirm that identity. It's a film made as a course correction. Rather than adding anything completely new into it, like say some of the concerns are, but I feel its role is to really act as more of a course correction yeah like you're saying this is the film that into darkness really needs to be Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day into darkness has some good elements in it but it's very much weighed down by its plot issues and the things that don't need to be there Mm -hmm. whereas this it's actually does add new elements in the fact that it adds new crew members yeah and again utilizes crew much better than any of the other star trek films have done for quite a long time and and i'd even rope in some of the next generation films in with that because i don't feel like they ever really utilize their crews particularly well in those films either no i mean as anybody who's listened to our best forgotten movies podcast specifically our latest episode our star trek the final frontier episode will know that i'm not really in the next generation fan since recording that i've actually watched two seasons of the next generation and all of the films and the one thing i will say about the films is the characters that are in them aren't really the same characters as are in the, no. <laughs> in the series especially no. picard He's picard is much, completely different in the into john mcclain yeah in the movies like, I, I, I love it in the plinket reviews where they always go back to insurrection yeah some plot similarities to an earlier next generation episode and literally picard does the exact opposite of what his character in the tv show does yeah and just really marks the contrast between what they're going for whereas at least in this new series the characters are consistent with their tv counterparts i'd say for into darkness they got the characters spock wrong yeah whereas in this definitely feels more like spock yeah i'd say that you're absolutely right and i remember there was even some complaints about the spock that's presented in star trek as well yeah being yeah, yeah. more of a violent murderous spock <laughs> which um he is but i i kind of like that i think if you have to reboot something or remake it then to take it in a new direction is the way to go rather yeah. than just to repeat what's come before and I've always thought that they did that kind of well, but I think that they actually took them too far with Star Trek Into Darkness. It's almost like they've embraced that anger element a little bit too far, really. Yeah. In fact, actually, I think it's some sad parts of during the making of the film that helped inform that, that yeah. character because this is a film that, because uh, it went into pre-production around the time that Leonard Nimoy died, mm-hmm. they were actually able to, to honour him, but actually integrate his death into the story, yeah. which I think helps inform the Spock character, the younger Spock character more, and helps him become more like 
yeah. Spock of old. And it's not just a thing that happens on the peripheries of, of the story as well. Oh, it's, it's not yeah, just central to the plot. A scene that has a tribute. Yeah, it is, and it's central to that character as well. In fact, I'd actually say that even though Leonard Nimoy doesn't appear in this film, his uh, appearance is actually better yeah. than Into Darkness, because Into Darkness is just shoehorned in there. Well, with Into Darkness, all he does is he turns up and he reminds us that Wrath of Khan exists. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, well, here's what we did in this other film. In this much better film. So here's what you should do. <laughs> it feels like a cheat code. Yeah. His, his yeah. appearance in Into Darkness feels like somebody's just pressed the Nam code sheet into their <laughs> controller. Um, <laughs> or found it you made. What did you do in this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm on this level. What happened? <laughs> what, how did you get past this monster? So, yeah, I again, I am glad to watch a Star Trek film in which Spock doesn't legitimately attempt to murder someone. Yeah. And the best thing of this film is the characters and the way that they're utilized. I'm so glad to see Bones given something to do because yeah. Carl Urban is amazing casting as yeah, Bones. He's got really it perfectly, is. including the eyebrow raise. It's not mimicry. He's not doing a impression. He's doing something that feels more organically like it, it is the same character, but it's got a Carl Urban twist to it. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that they did in the film to make it work much better is that they split Kirk and Spock up and then paired Spock with Bones yeah. and with Chekhov and Scotty in different yeah. places. So it gave the Spock-Bones relationship more time to breathe. Yeah. Whereas before, you had a couple of little interjections before it went back to Kirk and Spock. Yeah, definitely. And I'd say the film has a few touching moments that actually brought tears to my eye as well. Yeah. Which I, I haven't felt watching a Star Trek film since the very beginning of yeah. Star Trek. Uh, yeah, you just 09. have a lot more time to spend with the, with the cast. I'd say the only one that probably gets less screen time than than they did in the previous films is probably like Uhura. But that's maybe. because her role was amplified for the yeah, previous yeah. films. Yeah, to be politically correct and everything like that. But yeah. they'd still deal with that because obviously the major new character is a female character anyway. And she's great. Oh, yes, brilliant. And the other thing as well, uh, I'm not I'm not sure this is because Simon Pegg actually helped write the film, is that there's a lot more Scotty in this film yeah. than the other ones. Because I always felt that I like Simon Pegg's depiction of Scotty, but he just disappears for huge chunks of the last two films. Well, his inclusion in the first one, I would say, is one of my nitpicks because he just appears out of nowhere on yeah, some ice yeah, planet yeah. somewhere. And then in the second one, he spends half the film at a bar. Well, that's the thing with the second film that this film does. It's only up until this film I've actually feel like they actually got going. Like, yeah, they should have got going in the second film, mm -hmm. but the, the second film just, it's too preoccupied with being on Earth and never quite get going. Or the fact that they don't even get on their mission yeah. until the end of the second film, which is, I find so strange. Yeah. And the fact that we don't see a, a glimpse of Earth on this one oh, <laughs> is uh, a it's massive such a relief. relief. Yeah, it really is. And uh, the title itself as well, Star Trek Beyond, yeah. says uh, everything. I'm glad that they fulfilled on that promise of going yeah. beyond. And there's no kind of massive destruction of Earth. There is a space station that looks quite like it could be Earth-like, but even that is... It's sci-fi enough to it, just... Exactly, yeah. yeah, to be its own thing. And it, it makes that whole part of it, which is kind of, say, something they had to do, obviously because it's a studio note thing, but they did it in the most inventive way because it's a sci-fi looking place. Therefore, they can be much more visually inventive with what yeah. they're doing. Whereas with the climax to Into Darkness, all it is is just 9-11 with the Enterprise crashing yeah. into buildings. Pretty which, much, yeah. And then just glossing over the fact. Whereas with this, they can be a lot more creative and uh, a lot less destructive. Mm -hmm. You don't have that sort of destruction porn weighing on you. Because the problem I had at the end of Into Darkness is like, shit, the Enterprise just killed thousands of people by mowing into this city. And they never address it. Yeah, there's even like a memorial at the end and nobody mentions the thousands yeah. of people that surely must have died yeah. in this crash but the thing is that i liked about this an effort was made to prevent civilian casualties as yes. well yeah if i had to push you would you say that this film is one that has any flaws yeah i felt like it probably could have gone a bit more beyond as in the title yeah like a little bit more exploratory but like i was saying before this is really having to do the work that the second film should have done yeah so i can't really blame them for that uh, the only other thing as well i mean that this reboot series has always been notable for having um weaker villains and i'd probably say maybe the case for this one with the villains not the most interesting villain in the whole wide world no but i do like the twist 
that they give it. In fact, I'd say that's the villain's saving grace that they have this twist in the film. And in fact, it turned a, a rather generic villain into something that's actually a lot more interesting. Yeah, that's what I would say as well about the villain is for a large portion of it, I thought, oh, it's a serviceable villain. Yeah. The rest of the film's so much stronger that I really didn't mind, but he was okay. He was doing his job. And then it, this twist came along and I was like, oh, now I get it. Yeah. Now I am firmly on board with this yeah. character. Um, I would say that if I had to push for any flaws, I would say that some of the action earlier on is a little bit shaky, specifically with the destruction of the Enterprise, which is a fantastic sequence. Mm. There was a couple of scenes that I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but there was enough that I could still get involved in the action. Yeah. Although I definitely say that of all three attempts at destroying the Enterprise, this is probably the best. This is the best. Because it uses the description of the Enterprise, uh, it integrates it more into the story rather than just blowing it up for blowing up sake. Yeah, because I remember watching the trailer, and um, I haven't seen the trailer in ages, but it made me think that the destruction of the Enterprise was going to be over relatively quickly. And this is it's an entire act of the film in and yeah. of itself, really. Yeah. It's, it's a structured destruction and even after the destruction they they're still able to use the enterprise constructively within the story as well yeah like and i'd say my only really major misgiving on a story level is that i never really got the MacGuffin of the film which is some ancient artifact i think that's brushed over somewhat but the film isn't really a about that. No, no, it doesn't really say, concern I'd, itself. I would like a little that. bit more history about this MacGuffin. I would like it to have a little bit more weight. But the film isn't really interested in exploring that any further. Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, they're just saying, it's a MacGuffin. We all know what those are. We're not really concerning ourselves with that anyways. So. Yeah. And I think yeah, the other thing as well, we've probably got to just mention as well, is there was this whole Sulo gay thing that uh, obviously George Takai objected to. At the end of the day, when you're watching the film, it's like, what was all the fuss about? Because yeah. they did it in probably the most tasteful way you could possibly imagine. And also, it made the attack on the Yorktown a lot better because you had a lot more personal stakes for members of the crew. Because the thing is, with the Into Darkness thing, there was no one else there to connect with on the ground. Yeah. Uh, other than the people that were above ground anyway. To be honest, it was dealt with... I mean this in the most positive light as well, because Hollywood has a history of not really being the most sensitive in regards to subjects such as homosexuality or racial issues. And Star Trek, on the other hand, has always been really quite progressive in that way. I really like the way that they dealt with it because, number one, it didn't feel like it was being pushed in our faces like this was something that we had to take Yeah, it didn't make a big deal of it. It It wasn't like, look at these guys. These guys are gay and and they have a child. Look at them. Look at them. Yeah. They weren't special because of that. They were just people. And at the same time, it also didn't feel like it was uh, being brushed under the carpet. It just felt like an organic part of the story yeah. to give a character stake, mm-hmm. and personal stakes. And it, it was dealt with much like any relationship with any other character in a film would have been dealt with. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So Star Trek Beyond, would you recommend it? Absolutely. I say if you did feel a little bit jaded uh, with Into Darkness, and actually even if you enjoyed Into Darkness, I feel that this film is a really good chapter yeah. in the Star Trek series. I mean, just period, not even just in this reboot series. I just feel like it's a very enjoyable, nice, self-contained chapter in the Star Trek uh, movie series. Like I say, it's not going to change anything massively for you, but I think it's just going to reaffirm what Star Trek is for people yeah. rather than riffing off another series. It feels more like Star Trek, basically. I do agree with you, and I think that Star Trek Beyond is a film that has been sorely missed in the rest of this summer period we have had such a dearth of quality in terms of the summer blockbusters i'd say yeah this is definitely the strongest summer movie uh, definitely stronger. i would as well yeah. it's fun and it was far beyond my expectations i would yeah. say as well i would wholeheartedly recommend it like you say it's not going to change any lives doesn't do anything crazily different but it, what it does it does really really well yeah and, and star trek's back baby and it's fun without being fluffy either yeah which so is nice so thanks for listening to popcorn digest i've been gareth and i've been andy and thanks for listening fear of death is illogical Fear of death is what keeps us alive. Everyone who goes there, he kills. That's our friends out there. We kind of just leave them behind. Unity is not your strength. It is a weakness. I think you're underestimating humanity. Hold on to something! Fire will! Do it! Do it! Yeah. 
Pardon me. 